around uh, three to five centimeters. Okay, so it should be around four to five centimeters. So the theories of removing the entire antrum don't hold weight and people believe that it's the anterior mill which works to push the food through uh, and that helps in uh, greater gastric emptying. So most of us do believe that. So we, we've learned two things at least, that one is the bougie side should be that much and the antrum should be left behind. Uh, movie, now, one small uh, observation I would love to share and I would love to know the feedback of the people. When we are putting the bougie or when we, we are request the NSS to pass on the bougie, what we have noticed is that if we are making sure that it is on to the lesser curvature and it goes into the pylorus and it goes into the duodenum, then it stays there itself and it remains on to the lesser curvature. But if it is not going into the duodenum or it has not crossed the pylorus, then it can swindle to the greater curvature, then also the pyloric size can become different. So we always make it a point. Should not be taught here. Always make it a point that it should go in such a manner that we can see, and we call this as orgasmic feeling. That as soon as it crosses the pylorus, it goes into the tube. Now. I don't know how many have uh, noticed that. Or okay, so that brings me to that point. How many place the bougie before the first fire? How many place the bougie before the first fire? So a lot here. I think more. I I don't place the bougie before. First fire. How many don't place the bougie before the first fire? So it's it's probably an maybe 60, 40. So uh, the reasons why you'll place the bougie before the first fire is pretty obvious. You don't want to cause a, a, a stricturing. The reason why we we probably don't mind. Would you like to know why you don't place the bougie before the first fire? And, uh, in future, I want to make a little wider uh, sleeve, and then I take uh, along with the bougie. So there is no chances of kinking or. Uh, so you believe tube. that with the bougie they can be kinky? Yeah. If it is narrow at that angle, yes. so it should not be, it should be wide enough, wider than the previous. Uh, so those who put the in the bougie believe that if you pass, then there's no kinky. This also it is my if at that level is very wide. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the reason why I don't put it personally is because I just feel that it's easier to pass the bougie. In and when you put it in first, you always have a tendency to then push, try to stick to the booty to get the antrum. And sometimes the booty gets taught and you don't really know, especially when you're training a lot, you, you're not always there in the theater when one of your assistants is operating and you don't know really what they do. So that's why I try to standardize procedures and that's the reason why I don't place the booty. Uh, we, we always place the booty first, but thinking in the mind is that it is the leak at the angle of his which is occurring, but the pathology is at the level of at end. the lower end. Yeah. So, which color cartridge do you all use for the first fire? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Just one question Simon. before. Uh, there is a kind of bougie that has the antral balloon, which gauge the size of yes. the antrum. Yes. So, anyone have uh, experience or comment on this type of type of uh, uh, calibration tube? So, Michelle uh, pioneers that kind of bougie, but it's an expensive form to use a, a simple bougie. So. I don't know, it's too expensive to use that because uh, it's a balloon you can use once and I, I don't know who, sir, Dr. Kuller. How do you, how do you inflate it, with what? Okay, and how many cc do you inflate? 10, 50 or 15 cc? Uh, and between the first and second fire, do you move the bougie up and down then? No, yeah, you can, you can fix this bougie. You put, it, put the bougie before you put your first fire. Okay. So the balloon goes into the pylorus. Okay. In the pyloric area, in okay. the antrum basically. Okay. And then you have a straight bougie up. And you okay. just go around the side of the uh, bougie. And, I mean, uh, okay. there's no chance of any kinking or any uh, angulation uh, at incisura. Okay. It's a good, good thing. Okay. But that is called as mid-sleeve. Mid yeah, mid sleeve. Yeah, that. But but the problem is, if you want to calibrate your entral pouch size, you the the balloon can take anywhere between I think from zero to 70, 80, or even 100 mils into that balloon, that small thing. And if you actually calibrate it and take it out and then do gastrographin studies or whatever, you 
I know it is touted for actually pouching the size of the Entrum, but I do not know whether that calibration in its own is right because it's not a fixed structure. The Entrum is, you can expand, it can contract, depends on which state you're calibrating it. Uh, and the second problem that I've had with the, sometimes with the balloon is that the balloon will rotate, especially if you reuse it. And if the balloon rotates, then you have to go to fix it, and it creates a problem. But your comment is very fair that uh, it actually gives you a protective effect at the incisura because the balloon rides right on top of the incisura. So that's, that's one big advantage of it. Antrum, Antrum never acts as a reservoir. So where do you want to calibrate to 50cc or 40cc? The action of the antrum is just pumping, it's a mill. So it's that is precisely what I'm trying to say is the company markets it that way. All right, so but it is, they say, oh, you can use it for calibration, but I do not find a use of it to calibrate my entral pouch ever. So that, that is just the way you market things. Okay, so uh, uh, let's go in terms of what size cartridge do we use? To, uh, are there any specific preferences for the antrum, for the fundus, for the mid-body level? Do you all differ in, in color of cartridge, uh, or do you just use one plain one? Uh, we'll start with Shabi, since you've got the mic. Um, I, I think what uh, do you use for the fundus? What do you use for the antrum? Do you use anything different for revisional? These three answer them. Okay, so firstly, for the antrum, it varies upon the thickness of the feel that I have with my grasper. Uh, it can vary anywhere between black, green, and gold. Black, green, and gold. Yes, depending upon how thick the entrum is. Generally, I finish off either with a gold or a blue cartridge, uh, the last fire. The fundus is gold yes. or blue. And uh, redo is always black and green. Black, so use a 15 mm uh, 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 yeah, because my central choker is always 15 mm, so okay. that's where the umbilical one, where I extract my sleeve specimen okay. from. So I have no problems putting in a 15 okay. from there. Uh, Dr. Bhatia? Yeah, f we use uh, green at the first go at the pylorus, and then blues all over. In revisional surgery, all greens. All greens, very good. Wilfred? Yes, I use green cartilage all the way. Uh, I haven't tried the black cartilage for redo. So. so for uh, green all the way, even yes. for normal sleeves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Green? Green all the way. And you don't find it bleeding at the level of the fundus or anything of that sort? Well, bleeding is good if you notice it. Uh, one point is uh, we, uh, we don't want to, uh, first of all, the, the re initial reason why I use green is all the way because I don't want my nurse to be uh, confused, chaotic, uh, confused regarding what type of uh, cartilage I'm using. Uh, I find the bleeding is not too much a problem, so this is uh, okay. the reason why. If I use Ethicon, first green, gold, and blue, and I'm using uh, tri stapler all uh, purple. All purple. So his nurse is very intelligent. <laughs> green, gold, and blue. First one black, and then purple. Black and, and then purple. purple. All, all the way. So that's COVID, uh, this thing. Always yeah. standard. Okay. I use both. Uh, so for. JNJ, I used green and blue. For the other company, I use uh, purple. For the uh, yeah, original, I use uh, the green. Okay, Dr. Sidhu? Uh, we use first two green cartridges, then blue. Right. Okay, Dr. Morris, this one's for you. What happens when you use a, a protective material on the staple line? Let's say, do you go higher on the cartridge length? So instead of a blue, do you use green? Instead of a green, do you use black? Do you recommend that as a company? What do you think? If you use a peri strip or a seam guard, whatever you were to use. Do, do, do you mean, uh, do you speak about the fiber incidence the, the here or just for peri strip? The peri strip. The if peri I were to use a peri strip, do I go higher on my cartridge length or do I remain to blue? I don't think so. I, I'm, I'm sorry because I've not been very well trained at the okay. moment on peri strip, okay. but I don't think you have to, to change your habits. You just put the buttressing material on the cartridge you are used to use. Okay, it's the same cartridge. Same no, cartridge. No. I think it is, it is the other way around, that if we are thinking of using the buttress material, you have to go one step further up. One step. Because the thickness is more, as simple as that. So, anybody, do you all use a different set no, of cartridge? I, I, I don't use the buttress material. So you don't use? Yeah. Yeah, maybe one size large, larger if I'm using buttress, but... Uh, Camilo? If you're going to use buttress material, you should go at least one or even two uh, 
times uh, higher in terms of height of the stapler. Uh, you, you would never use a blue one, for instance, with, with buttress material, especially, in, in, I think, in, in any area of the stomach. Uh, definitely, because sometimes the, you can have, uh, depending on the company, but the, sta the, the stapler, the, it's, it's not, you, you can have a, a misfire or you're going to tear the, the tissue after that. So it's going to be, you know, the, uh, even I would say that Raul is now uh, advocating to use only greens or even uh, the, the new ones that are even, even thicker. Yeah, I would use a golden whenever I'm using a pale strip, the cook one or the seam guard. Normally, yeah, I would go green, golden, blue, 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 then again golden with the pale strip at the angle of face. No, golden. I think seam guard. Uh, the first uh, four, three to four staplers green, and the last two blue. Makes it almost bloodless. With the seam guard. With the seam guard. Okay, uh, Dr. Chaube is here. Dr. Kular, you all use seam guards uh, a lot in the sleeves. Do you all use anything different? The first and the last fire, the first fire uh, near the pylorus with the green cartridge, and the last fire where you are near the G junction, green cartridge with seam guard. The rest we use blue. That gives you a p almost, uh, you know, a bloodless uh, okay. sleep. Vijay, do you use seam guards? Or too expensive? Okay. So, uh, the one thing for, I personally don't use seam guards myself, but if uh, you were to use seam guards, you use a thicker length, and that's what came out of the consensus statement, that if you were to use a blue, normally go to green, or like Camilo said, go, one, go to black. So it is very clear for most of you people who are learning right now and doing bariatrics, please don't use blue if you're using, like Dr. Bhatia said, go one step higher, and that will be the correct one. Uh, for those people who use seam guards on the last fire, like you said, do you believe that uh, using seam guards prevents leaks? not about the leaks definitely it, uh, but definitely bleeding is almost uh, no dominant. so you're using it at the top fire not using it in the middle because you you don't want it to bleed on the top so see i think the bleeding is very difficult to control at the fundal area rather than the controlling at the rest of the places okay so it's for bleeding yes anybody uses it at the top to to prevent a leak because you believe it prevents a leak uh, it's not mainly for preventing leak, but if you have a bleed and you try to suture there, then you cause necrosis of the tissue and may induce a leak. So basically, if there's no bleeding there, then you're not using any other extensive force. Okay, so anybody here believes that uh, using uh, buttress material prevents leaks? Uh, I initially believe it until the last, the first leak there, to the endoscope, I see my very strip outside. <laughs> Then I don't believe it anymore. Okay, so more or less, yeah, Bala. There's a paper by Michelle comparing uh, seam guard. Apart from bleeding, it takes care about leak also. But of course, it's a small study. We need to have further studies. I believe uh, leak at, because why we say this piece, there is a point. When you do redo surgery, even uh, Mufi is using a peristrip or seam guard. Why? Okay. Some, peop <laughs> some people use either a seam guard or buttressing material in redo surgeries or take a suturing. Why? The idea is we are worried about leak. I strongly believe till we need to have further studies, but there may be some room. We have to wait and see. Uh, Dr. Mufi, can I just come in? Yeah. I, I think using leaks at the right at near the angle of his has only one role. <laughs> and that is in the context, if you dissect the angle of his very clearly, you are very likely that the adventitia around the esophagus would get stripped. And if you are a snugger and you happen to take a bite of that esophagus with a normal staple that is without a buttress material, your staples are not going to hold on that esophagus because as long as you have no muscle fibers, you're sure going to get a leak. So if in that case you want to snug and you're going to write on top of it, I do not know, but probably it may prevent. But if you keep it to convention and you do not go very near the esophagus, and I think that prevents the leak even if you don't put a buttress material. Okay, uh, how many of you, uh, you believe that uh, there is, uh, 
you staple first and then divide the gastrocolic or the gastrosplenic uh, ligament. How many people staple first and then divide the gastrocolic or gastrosplenic? Mahendra. Anton. So the rest of us believe in uh, division uh, entirely before we do. How many of you dissect the entire stomach of the pancreas? Everybody. So if there are any adhesions that need to be separated. How many of you identify the left cross of the diaphragm? Entirely. Uh, how many of you actively look for a hiatus on you? And if there is a hiatus on you, I'll come back to my exports first before coming to the audience. What do you do? If there is a hiatus on you in a sleep, what do you do? Just take care of the hiatus hernia, remove the sac back in, and then close the cushion. You That's close it. the crura on the top or the bottom? On the bottom. Bottom? Yep. If we do see a hiatus, we just uh, do a cruroplasty. That's what it is. Cruroplasty, okay. But ideally, ideally, we should be knowing that there's a hiatus hernia, if there's a hiatus hernia, before and uh, then proceeding for a sleep. Bypass. 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 Yeah. Before, See, uh, before undertaking a bariatric, you should not. If the patient is not symptomatic, we are not an endoscopy, and we instantly find hiatus, I don't do anything, I do sleep. And I don't see any reason that most of these patients, when they lose weight, their hiatus improves. I have not taken any floral suturing so far. Okay. Alfred? So if there's small hiatus hernia, I repair anti repair. But if anterior. it's big, then I would do a posterior repair. I routinely do gastroscopies for all my patients. I pre-assess them for hiatus hernia. But even then, sometimes on table you find a loose well, I, I don't actively then look for it. Oh, you don't actively look? I, I don't. Okay, it, you don't because don't. I do endoscopies. If I don't find any evidence of it, I wouldn't look for it. So you don't look for it? Uh, we strongly go in for doing the pre-operative endoscopy. If the hiatus hernia is there, we sell the gastric bypass rather than the sleeve. If the patient still agrees with the sleeve, then we dissect the crura and then we repair it posteriorly rather than anteriorly. Posteriorly. Dr. Uh, we repair it anteriorly after reducing the hernia. Okay. Uh, what size of hiatus hernia, what size of lax hiatus will make you convert it to a gastric bypass? Anybody from the... More than three centimeters. More than three centimeters. I think it's more of the type of hiatus hernia rather than whether you're talking about sliding, rolling, uh, is the G-junction really down there? If the G-junction is really down there, all you need to get is a crural closure, which is the principle of GERD surgery, uh, then that should be it. But if it's the other way around and your G-junction is up there, then I think a bypass suits the patient better. I mean, it's very simple. I think any hydrology is symptomatic, irrespective of size, need gastric bypass. Gastric bypass. Anybody with a different opinion? Uh, any hiatus hernia which is big enough on pre-op endoscopy or uh, this, would you would convert to a gastric bypass? Anybody differing from that opinion? Would you still, there is, there is a thought process and I know some surgeons who believe that you should still do a sleep because when the patient loses weight, his, his gastroesophageal reflux symptoms come down and therefore you should still do a sleep. Anybody for that? Nobody. You, okay. Praveen? Not all patients with hiatus hernia will have a GERD. I mean, a significant GERD with a DM stroke more than 20, 24. Not all normal patients, I mean, all non hiatal patients do not suffer from GRD. It's, it's either, either ways. I think the patient's symptoms is most important, whether the patient has a hiatal hernia or not. Most often, you're not sure. I think we need to get a pH study done, get the DMEs to score done before we're going at with a sleep gastrant. To make sure the DMEs So you do is all done. your patients for? For doubtful patients, whom which we are not sure of the GERD. There is small doubtful hiatus hernias where we are planning to go out with a sleeve. I think we need to get a pH study done. And in these patients, when we are planning to do a if the mister score is low, we are planning to do a sleeve, I think it's better not to dissect the hiatus too much because the phrenoesophageal membrane will be damaged. That's one of the important components of the OG junction, of maintaining the OG angles. Yeah. Murphy. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, yeah. one of the things that I do is I test the hiatus every time. And uh, I'm going to show you a video in the next session when I'm doing it. Um, and we do a balloon test of the hiatus. Now, a lot of the times you look at a hiatus and you think, oh, that looks okay. But there's a big fat pad up behind it and you can't really be sure. 
we get a, um, I get the bougie with the balloon and we put 10 cc's of fluid in and we, my anaesthetist pulls it through. If it goes through, we do an, a repair of the hiatus. If it's a large hiatus, like you said, you do an anterior and posterior crural repair. But if it's just a small one which the balloon goes through, we do an anterior repair. Mupi, if you uh, keep dissecting right and left cross, every person you'll see hiatus. Oh, I just want to make a comment on, on what is uh, Dr. Gagné ad advocating now in the, I've seen him in the last uh, congresses, uh, and I think that's it's too much. He, uh, I think it's started to, to ask, asking uh, something different to a sleeve. Uh, I think if someone has reflux, that shouldn't have a sleeve, and that's it. Uh, it's, it's at least our opinion. In general, a patient that has uh, clinical signs of reflux or yatal hernia, uh, I'm, we are speaking about closing yatal hernias when it's something that you didn't see in the pre-op state and you get in, uh, you're in the OR, you don't have a pH and pensiometry and you are there with a yatal hernia, well, repair it. But it's not that if you have preoperatively someone with a big yatal hernia reflux uh, and I've seen Michelle saying, oh, you can do a, you can do a, a sleep gastrectomy anyway, you close the, the yatal hernia and this patient's going to be okay. I think that's a bad thing because those patients are going to have a lot of reflux uh, after surgery. I think just, just a comment about the hiatal hernia. I think the, the, the principle is you have to have intra-abdominal esophagus. It's not the cruel closure. So unless you dissect the hiatus, you're not going to know if you have intra-abdominal esophagus. So if you do a Nissen, a lot of times you think you have intra-abdominal esophagus, but when you dissect, you find that that's not the case. So if you think someone has a hiatal hernia, you have to really dissect it. They have to confirm they have at least two, three centimeters of intra-abdominal esophagus because that's what's going to prevent reflux, and then you can close it uh, and do what you need to. But you have to confirm that intra-abdominal esophagus, I think. Okay. And uh, if a patient has persistent symptoms of reflux post a sleeve, how long do you treat him, uh, treat him on PPIs? Six weeks. Six weeks. Longer? What do you do after six weeks if it persists? Then now obviously one has to continue and one can advise the endoscopy again. No, but for how long? Let's say a patient one year later complains of reflux still. What do you do? I think then we should go in for pH metry and manometry and then fix the problem. Sometimes the patient has alkaline reflux and not acidic reflux. What do you do? I, I think one has to sell, then one has to go in for bypass then. I mean, in today's day and age, there are more devices available. All you need to do is just take a small ring, that uh, magnetic ring, it's called the Kelly's ring or something like that, and it's beaded. All you need to do is just put that, and it gives you a nice tight sphincter. You don't have to go and convert to bypasses and all that. Uh, there's electro the gastric electronic stimulation devices available. It gives you a very nice sphincter tone back. So endostim, they're all available. Okay, so uh, in fact, I don't find too many patients have reflux. I follow five years and dose with them. There are some, maybe three to five percent have some occasional problem, but usually due to the diet. So I find that difficult in taking rice, carbohydrate, that kind of thing. So I think <coughs> diet advice is also important. Yeah, I think we can continue PPAs for the long term. There is no reason. Irrespective, can, beyond yeah, one yeah, year. If we, even if we can control uh, reflux by PPA, the same. Reflux. We can control PPA. There is no guideline that we should stop after one year or six months. Okay. Atul? If it is persistently causing problems in spite of adequate or optimum use of PPA, then you have to convert into gastric bypass. I really can't answer that question because I really don't have too many uh, sleeves. And the uh, sleeve that I have done, and if they actually come up with reflux, most of them will settle down with some of the PPIs and dietary advices. So I haven't really converted anyone, any sleeve into a bypass because of persistence. So I really don't know. Yeah, me too. I think uh, they can put them on PPI. Why? Because uh, we made it, uh, we, we take out the uh, compliance of the stomach, but that part is the acid producing, so acidity is reducing. And also from the study, the uh, gastric emptying time is reducing. So that's, I think, uh, PPI would help. Okay. Just one quick uh, round. Uh, just one second. Uh, one quick. Um, they're running short on time. One sec. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, this one question. How long do you persist on PPIs for everybody? Anybody persists more than six months, a year? Would you convert to a gastric bypass? Just quick answers, please. They're running short on time. One, one year. One year. I think the first year, everybody has a, lot, a bit yes. of reflux. After that, I think it's bad. By bypass. You convert to a bypass. Yeah, but at least one year. At least one year.
Dashi? If we have para esophageal symptoms getting worse or if it is going to be a Barrett's, yes, we have. Otherwise, I don't think there's a reason of six months, one year, if it's just a uh, GRD alone. But how many of you have converted after one year for persistent symptoms or uh, stopping them? Uh, one, 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 one case so far where the patient has developed Barrett's. No, it was yes, it was, I think it was the era when we had not done endoscopy for a sleeve. Uh, we saw a small hyatasthenia, but still we had not done anything, just do a sleeve. Patient came back with very intractable, had paralyzed with symptoms after six times very seriously, could dry cough, and patient was getting a depression and Barrett's. So we converted, and patient is happy now. Uh, maybe the last comment for this. Uh, there are recent studies which talk about not only about the hyatasthenia or the GERD, they talk about the pylorospasm. We have to look at the pylorus as one of the important organs which can give you GRD-like symptoms, especially after sleeve, because we are converting into it, uh, converting into uh, the whole stomach into a very narrow tube, high pressure zone tube. So that is something which need to be looked upon, not only the hiatus. Sorry for the interruption. I mean, yeah. there's a question about the PPIs. A question to you and all the more, is there actually a role of PPIs? Because most of this reflux is non-acid reflux. Yeah, that's the thing. I think enough studies have said it's not acid reflux, but non-acid reflux. So the qu role of PPI is a contra controversial entity, and the role of pH study is, again, a controversial entity, because pH study can pick up only acid reflux. No, we there are impedance there are, tests. We need there are impedance, impedance tests. Yeah. That only yeah. can pick up a non-acid reflux. Yeah. So I think a PPI role is, I think, a controversial. I think we have to answer that. Probably not, lots of, it's a good question. Lots of good data is saying that even in patients with combined reflux, acid and alkali, by reducing the acid component, you actually That's already very, very symptoms. meager. No, the, it's very meager. There is no alkaline reflux without a combined acid reflux as well. Because the OG junction is, because of higher pressure inside the stomach, it pushes up not only the stuff from the bile, but a little bit of acid. So what we need is a prokinetics you rather need a than a You need a combination of prokinetics, but prokinetics are not cleared by USFDA for long term. Whereas the good news, guys, is that PPAs are cleared by USFDA for 25 years. Okay, the just last question before we wrap up. Uh, do you believe in the use of sealants or glues or theme guards? Dr. Morris, of course, he believes. Dr. Morris. <laughs> I believe, but I try to give you an aspect of the evidence. No, there I, is, I know there you There is no statistical show. proof, but there is a good trend in favor yes. of. How many people use sealants or glues after the sleeve? OK, not too many. Only in single incision. OK. Okay, and Mofi, I strongly believe that it is better to have your own children rather than test tube babies. <laughs> okay. How many people do single incision uh, or reduce spot sleeve gastrectomies here? It's a green, growing number. Good, join the gang. Thank you so much, gentlemen. You're running extremely Thank short you. time. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Mufazal, for running uh, this panel discussion. It was. Uh, interesting discussion thank you for all the participants as well we would like to start our third uh, discussion and uh, third session and we would like thanks the covidian for sponsoring this session um, it will uh, i would like also to invite dr bandari for uh, giving us a speak speech about pouch size and uh, the uh, the banded pouch
Good evening, everybody. Uh, I thank, at the outset, I thank Dr. Mufi and Dr. Aparna for inviting me for this lecture. The pouch and the banded gastric bypass. So the gastric bypass still remains the gold standard, and uh, why do we need to put a band on it, and why do we need to modify it when it still remains the gold standard? So are, are we facing long-term weight regains and uh, with the existing technique of the gastric bypass? And you know, at the end of uh, being uh, 25 years now with bariatric surgery, we are still not able to standardize on the pouch size, size of limb length, size of anastomosis, the closure of mesenteric defects, hands to an orwell linear cutter stapler. So there are so many variations. And still we are confused about uh, gastric bypass being a restrictive procedure or a malabsorptive procedure or a combined procedure. So uh, considering all these facts, what are we facing nowadays? And we are facing uh, two years post-gastric bypass on a diagnostic laparoscopy, this, which is a dilatation. And the patient started to eat into the rule limb. And we, uh, the studies have said, and there are a lot of them which have said that there's a long-term weight regain uh, with gastric bypass with faulty techniques, and there is a diabetes recurrence also with gastric bypass. So as they say that the shelf life of a gastric bypass for us bariatric surgeons is just five years. For some, it is just two years. For some, it is just, just one year. So what are we going, where are we going? And uh, for surgeons, young like us, who need to practice 25 years more, maybe are we going to have all our patients coming back with weight regain? Uh, so ultimately what is happening is that we are trying to treat the disease of brain by treating and cutting the stomach. So patient who has failed restriction throughout his life will even fail this restriction. That's why when I think that what is the most important step in doing a gastric bypass, I always feel that making a good pouch and probably putting in a ring in a virgin case makes a lot of sense to avoid weight regain. And the data presented by Malphobi and others have actually proved it. Now, what are the enemies of a perfect pouch? All of us doing gastric bypass in this audience should always question that are we, are we doing that bit to make that perfect pouch? And what are the enemies of a perfect pouch? So most of our stomachs when we make a pouch are filled with fluid, we don't evacuate it. There's a lot of fat which covers the pouch. There are additions between the stomach and the pancreas. There's defective calibration. We say that in India it's a 36 French boogie, but how many of us go very snug to the boogie and we fire it exactly 36 French? There is a lot of fundal redundancy when we make the pouch and obviously poor dissection. So these are some of the enemies of a perfect pouch. And now the steps to make a pouch, I'll straight away go to the video, but before that, uh, once we make a pouch, we have to remove the fat. Uh, we should do the perigastric space creation, insert the ring, lock the ring, and complete the anastomosis. And what I mean by making a perfect pouch is tubular, lesser curvature based, without fat layers, so you know exactly what is the capacity of your pouch. A 36 French boogie, good snugly calibrated, and basically a micro pouch. So there are three ways of doing a gastric bypass. We cannot do by a fourth way. It's a linear cutter, Hanson or Orville device. Now, how to make a pouch? So this is a simple video. Uh, there are different techniques. There's a lot of debate going on whether to do a perigastric or to do a pars flexida. I do a pars flexida for the simple reason being that there's no, uh, uh, there's no study which has definitiv definitively proved that there's a problem in it. We go and horizontally fire a linear cutter of six centimeters, a blue cartridge. And now the important steps start. There can be additions between the posterior part of the stomach. So you have to clear those additions if they are there, dissect that angle of his perfectly, remove that fat pad there, and make a space. Uh, once you have dissected that area completely and you have seen the left cruise of the diaphragm, uh, you can go below retrogastric and uh, make a space there so that you don't take fundus along in your dissection, and then start to fire. Once this space is made, then you can start to fire all your staplers. Now. Uh, for firing the stapler, it is important that your stomach is totally free from the posterior part. Otherwise, you'll make a very large pouch. Uh, I always say that if I'm using more than three cartridges to make my pouch, I'm not making a good pouch. That is my feeling. More than three cartridges to make a gastric pouch, you're making a large pouch. So this is how you make a pouch. Uh, now comes the perigastric dissection, which is a very important part of the, uh, of the whole step. Uh, you should remove this fat with a lot of patience anteriorly and posteriorly. There will be small perigastric veins which might bleed when you're doing this particular procedure, but don't bother about that, this bleeding stops. Come anteriorly also and remove this fat, because if you want to put in a ring, it's very important that you remove this fat. Do some perigastric dissection, and try to remove this fat as close to the lesser curvature as possible. Come under complete vision, dilate that area posteriorly, and then you can say that you have made this space and you are not damaging the posterior wall of the stomach because serosal tears here can be mucosal or muscularis and you will not be identifying them. So do this under complete vision. Uh, I usually use a gap P ring and uh, uh, 
uh, this particular ring of size 7 I use in all my gastric bypass now. We don't do a bypass without putting in a ring until unless the patient does not want it. And uh, uh, we, uh, we first engage this ring and then fix it uh, with a Maryland. Uh, it, it's a little bit tough ring to fix uh, uh, with initial experience, but once the number of cases goes by, you can fix the ring. The ring has to be locked properly. Uh, if you keep this ring loose, then it might dislodge and might erode into your jejunal component. Once the ring is locked, make it sure that when you try to disengage it, it does not come out. Uh, put the ring up just two to three centimeters below the G junction there, and then take the jejunal loop up to do the anastomosis. Uh, I start my anastomosis from the angle of his, so make, take a complete posterior layer and uh, do the anastomosis. I think the gastrojejunal anastomosis will be covered by uh, in a different lecture, so uh, this is just the anastomosis. I'm not going to go into the detail, but the last step, uh, it looks something like this, where you have completed all the four layers, and the ring still lies loose. You can see that the ring lies loose, and this is, this is how we do a banded gastric bypass. The banded gastric bypass obviously can, can also be done uh, if you want to do a hand swan. So this is another pouch which we make, and you can see it is just below the first gastric vein, the second gastric vein, just below the left gastric, and that is the left gastric is the only thing which is the supply of this particular stomach. Again, uh, needless to mention, dissect that particular area clearly, and this is the sort of pouch you want. Remove the fat, even if, uh, even if you're not putting a ring, then also remove the fat, you'll be able to take good bites. Bites which are taken on the fat are just you're trying to bluff yourself, you don't see the tissue, the bites will be, uh, either will not be proper and there can be a chances of leak. So remove all this fat, uh, make space like that and direct vision, put in a ring and lock the ring. So these are just different techniques of doing it. I'm not going to go into the details, but yeah, this is important. Most of us feel that Orville device, it is not possible to do a band, but yes, it is possible to do a band in an Orville device as well. Uh, uh, it is the same way like you do it. Now you see this particular case. A lot of fat is there on the pouch. You will not be able to recognize where is the pouch and where is fat. So make it sure that it might take a long time, but you dissect all this fat from there and uh, dissect the angle of his clearly. And once this fat is dissected, you will see that the picture changes completely. The pouch, which was looking so large, will actually look very small. Uh, I have seen this ring, it is very small, just like uh, uh, diameter will not be more than 1.5 to 2 centimeters. So uh, this, once you make, make this sure, uh, you will be able to do it. Now, uh, the Orville device, you can, I do it after giving intramuscular glucagon 30 minutes before under endoscopic guidance, because we have had cases where it got stuck up. So once this thing is there, uh, and the Orville device has been uh, inserted, then only I lock the ring. I just put the ring, but I lock it only once this device is out. Uh, now we lock this particular ring before firing the Orville, and once the ring is locked, then we fire the Orville, and rest of the steps are the same. Uh, there's, we fix the ring and then fire the Orville, so there's nothing uh, very special in this video. Uh, the important point I want to make uh, by, by showing this video is that you can see that the ring is still lying loose. So all of us who bother about the fact that there's a lot of dysphagia when you put the ring, it gets eroded. I have never had an occasion. We have done more than 300 banded bypass. Never had an occasion where a patient had dysphagia. In fact, patient does not even come to know that something has been done. So the important factors of doing a banded bypass and making good pouch, the port position is very important. Your triangulation, your technique, which is suitable to you, proper instruments and correct location of holding the male and female end of the gap ring if you're using this particular ring. A comparative analysis as we are doing has to be done to evaluate whether it is just a placebo or it really makes sense in doing a banded versus a non-banded and do a three, six, nine months follow up with the exact pouch volumetry and 3D recon study. And uh, obviously if you are doing a pouch volume, Calculate the pouch volume, see the size of stoma between your banded and non-banded, size of the rule limb and of the 3D recon study. This is one of the photographs where we have done a 3D recon study and we do it at regular intervals. Uh, my take home message is that banding the pouch preserves the reservoir capacity of the stomach and that is was, that it was being postulated by Luke Clemens, Malfobi and others who are putting in the ring. Uh, we have failures with non-banded bypass. It, it, we, ha we could have failures with banded bypass as well if we are faulty with that technique, but we, we surely have failures with the non-banded bypass, and I need not quote a lot of studies, but studies have proven that. If you do a first-time banded bypass, it is always better because rebanding it, doing a failure of a sleeve or doing a failure of a bypass, dissecting the pouch and putting in a ring, it's not easy. RCTs, specifically for Indian patients, are in need of, need of an R. Before refuting or before accepting, we need to do RCTs. And if, if at least we are not trying to put a ring or if we don't want to put a foreign body, try to make a perfect pouch. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ramoit, for the nice and wonderful demonstration and presentation. Would like also now to invite Dr. Rajesh Kolar for the gastrointestinal and gastrointestinal anastomosis, please. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I must thank Dr. Mufi and Dr. Aparna for inviting and uh, holding this conference at such a wonderful place. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to this Congress because, uh, yeah, this one. Because it is basically the <coughs> a group of surgeons, bariatric surgeons, who are doing actually doing surgery. And we can discuss things and come to a constructive uh, conclusion which most of us can do or bring it in our practice. Now, job given to me was to, uh, you know, to see the controversy in different type of uh, anastomosis or techniques uh, in doing a gastro anastomosis as well as the jejunal jejunal anastomosis. Now, uh, I bring greetings from our Department of Minimal Access and Metabolic Bariatric Surgery Center, MAX. Now, if you see first the gastro anastomosis, uh, you can have a stapled anastomosis, which could be a circular stapler, which in which the orbital can be passed through the transesophageal route, or it could be a circular stapler, which is passed through the transabdominal, or it could be a linear stapler anastomosis end to side. And then it could be a totally hand swing anastomosis, or now we have the banded outlet, as just now uh, Dr. Mohit Bhandari has discussed about that. <clears throat> now, if you see just a small video of the technique, that's the uh, Orville, which has been passed through the esophagus. Uh, it's passed through the gastric pouch. The tube is disconnected. The stapler comes through the abdominal wall, goes into the elementary limb, engaged to the orville, and then fired. And then the enterotomy is closed with a linear stapler. That's the technique of circular stapler, and that's the technique of a linear stapler in which you fire a linear stapler and anastomose the elementary limb with the pouch and close the enterotomy hand swing. You have already seen the totally uh, sutured anastomosis in the previous video. I don't have one because we haven't done one. Now, if you compare the different uh, techniques, there are advantages and disadvantages of different technique. If you use a circular stapler, especially if you use it through the transesophageal route, the envil is passed through the esophagus, the pouch is small, the main advantage is the constant stoma. But the potential disadvantage is the esophageal injury, that is one. Or sometimes the envil can get disconnected and it can uh, be left in the esophagus and the retrieval of that can be a problem. If you pass the envil through the abdominal wall, then the injury to esophagus is avoided, but it gives a large opening in the abdominal wall and it also increases the risk of abdominal port. In linear stapler, you have to, you anastomose it and close with the uh, suture, it avoids EEA stapler and avoids a large opening in the skin. But in this case, disadvantages that the stoma size is likely to, less likely to be uniform and requires suturing. In hand swing anastomosis, it can be constituted with the sutures. It definitely reduces the cost, that's the advantage, but you require good suturing skills and the operative time is a little longer. And the banded outlet, 
you pass the band around the outlet. It may enhance the long-term weight loss, but the disadvantage is the band can erode. Now, which procedure is better? I, I think we have to go into literature to see what literature tells you. Now, there's a study, I have collected few articles which, in each, which are uh, few are specifically for one particular procedure. This is an article in which there was a questionnaire to the surgeon to see how many surgeons use different kind of staplers. And this was uh, from the American Society for Bariatric Surgery Practicing Surgeon. 43% were using circular stapler, 41 using linear stapler, and 21% were doing hand swing anastomosis. And out of these, 93 persons were routinely testing the GJ intraoperatively, and 95 percent did not put any band around the pouch. Another study, the gastrojuvenal anastomosis, they were looking for the stricture following the bypass surgery, analysis of uh, more than 1,000 patients from 2000 to 2004, and in this case, they did the linear stapler, use of linear stapler. The stricture they found in 94 patients, 7.3% after more than 30 days of the procedure. And all of these were treated with balloon dilatation from one to four times, which led to two perforation. The conclusion from this study was that the GJ anastomotic stricture is the most common complication and the balloon dilatation is the first line of treatment for this kind of problem. Another study, ruined by gastric bypass, 1,040 patients. The aim was to see complications of ruined by gastric bypass where the anastomosis GJ is done by the hand swing. And the results, no anastomotic leak. The complication was not related to the GJ as such, but the problem was due to suboptimal exposure and bowel fixation technique when you are doing a hand suturing anastomosis. And it definitely requires advanced surgical suturing skill to do it completely hand suturing anastomosis. Now, when you see the circular stapler, there are studies in which they have compared the stapler, circular stapler, different sizes. Initially, the anastomosis was being done by 21 millimeter stapler, and now we are using 25 millimeter stapler. Now, this study, which was done for comparison between 21 and 25 millimeter circular stapler, in 374 patients, 25 millimeter size was used, and 64, 21 millimeter size stapler were used, and they found that the stricture, ulcer, and leak was more in 21 size stapler as compared to the 25 millimeter stapler size. So the incidence of stricture significantly increases when 25 millimeter size stapler is used in gastrojuvenal anastomosis. In a pooled analysis, there's another very good paper, the influence of circular stapler diameter on post-operative stenosis after laparoscopic GJ anastomosis and morbid obesity. It's a five trials pooled analysis, total patients 1,217, 21 millimeter stapler used in 392 cases and 25 millimeter stapler used in 82.4%. And the primary outcome was that there was increased incidence of stenosis with 21 millimeter size stapler. So the literature is in favor of using 25 millimeter sta circular stapler in most of the cases. Now, there are studies which have compared the three different techniques of GJ anastomosis. Uh, this is a good study which came in obesity surgery 2011. It's a study which has been conducted from 2004 to 2009, a total patients of 882. In 514 patients, linear stapler was used. In 180 patients, hand swing anastomosis was done. And in 140 patients, 25 millimeter circular stapler was used. And the result was that there is no significant statistically difference 
in the rate of leak, stricture, or marginal ulcer when any one of these techniques were used. So all the three techniques can be used safely with a low complication rate if they are done correctly. There's another study which is a uh, total patients, almost 9,904 patients, which included 44 surgeons. And in this uh, paper, they have <coughs> shown that the surgeons had done 66% circular stapler, 18% hand swing, and 16% linear stapler. And the result of this study was that the use of circular stapler was associated with increased rate of post-operative hemorrhage and wound infection. Another paper, the linear stapler technique may be safer than the circular stapler for GJ, a meta-analysis of comparative studies. Eight studies included with total patients of 1,321. The primary outcome of this study was the GJ leak and stricture, and the secondary outcome was post-operative operative time, length of hospital stay, post-op bleeding, wound infection, marginal ulcer, and estimated weight loss. And the result was that there is a significant decrease in the risk of GJ stricture and wound infection uh, in, and operative time when the linear stapler is used. There was no significant difference in other outcomes. Another paper in 2012, a linear stapler versus circular stapler, uh, a meta-analysis which is a pooled analysis of nine trials of almost 10,000 patients. Linear stapler was used in 2,946, circular in 6,428. The primary outcome was again GJ leak and stricture with secondary outcome of operation time, length of hospital stay, post-op bleeding, wound infection. And this also had almost the similar result. There was a statistically in significantly increased rate of GJ stricture associated with circular stapler anastomosis. The reduced rate of wound infection, bleeding, post-op time with the linear stapler, there was no significant difference in other outcomes. So going by the literature, I think literature favors the use of linear stapler for creation of gastrogenosomy as it decreases the risk of GJ stricture, wound infection, and operative time. And when circular stapler is used, 25 millimeter stapler significantly reduces the stricture rate as compared to 21 millimeter stapler. Now, uh, we go to the jejunal jejunal anastomosis. There are not many uh, literature uh, as far as this particular uh, step of the procedure is concerned. Now, jejunal jejunosmi can be create, created uh, stapled anastomosis and hand swing where you fire the stapler and close the enterotomy with sutures, or it could be totally stapled in which you fire two staples, one staple to create the anastomosis and second stapler to close the enterotomy, or it could be a triple staple technique in which you fire two staple uh, uh, at 180 degree and then close the enterotomy with the third stapler. Now, the advantage of two stapler technique is that it's faster closure but there is a, a higher risk of stenosis at the uh, elementary limb. In triple staple anastomosis, there is no risk of stenosis, uh, but yes, it increases the cost because you are using one more extra fire to close the enterotomy. Uh, staple plus hand swing, it increases the operative time. And it, some, it lowers the hand swing enterotomy closure lowers risk for stenosis. A small video about the technique. Uh, that's the fire, single fire, to make the jejunal anastomosis. And then close the enterotomy using suture. The important thing is to close the enterotomy transversely and not vertically to prevent uh, an stenosis at this site, or you can do a triple staple anastomosis in which you fire two stapler 180 degree to each other on either side.
That's the first stapler. Then the second stapler comes from the opposite side. And the stay sutures taken on the enterotomy and the third stapler fired to close the enterotomy. In literature, there are very few studies which have compared these uh, different techniques. Uh, I could find one study in which uh, there's a pr prospective evaluation uh, of intracorporeal small bowel anastomosis during the gastric bypass. They had 80 patients, and four patients had uh, small bowel obstruction. There was technical narrowing at JJ in two patients, angulation of the efferent limb at one, and food impaction at JJ uh, in one patient. And they had to do real laparoscopy in all these patients. And this was done by single staple and then hand swing of the enterotomy. Uh, there's another paper in which they uh, have used a triple staple technique in uh, their patients in almost 435 patients from 110 to 412 with no leak, one revision of JJ due to obstruction, and there was intraluminal bleeding of 21 patients, almost 4.8 percent patients. So the conclusion of this study was that using a triple staple technique is expeditious, safe, and associated with minimal complication. Uh, I will take this opportunity to invite all of you to the conference on uh, mechanism of mishap and risk reduction strategy in bariatric surgery at the Max Institute on 2nd and 3rd of August. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for the nice presentation. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. I would like to uh, present Dr. Abdurrahim Nimeri to give us a speech regarding mesenteric defect closure and the hiatal closures. It's not connected yet. No, hold on. Oh, don't. Um. I kind of closed at the beginning thinking that that would work. Did it pick it up? Hold on a second. Is it coming? Just give me a second. Give me a second. Wait for a second. It says no signal. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Something is happening. One second. There's nothing.
was it was not in it was not in it was not it was not in when he when he took it out it was hold on no, he no he, he actually had not had it in all the way it was only halfway in you can go to the settings and then you can have a new screen let's just give this a try wait for just one second if it doesn't go this time usually the best thing is to open everything up and then put the plug in this one uh -huh. Did it recognize it now? No? No, well, it's, it's giving us a, yeah. a run for Experts. our money. No. Okay, yeah, you, you, you yeah. close it up. Yeah, yeah which is your... Uh, is it because there are too many things open? Okay. So you close everything and then you get in again. Yeah, you can use it. I mean, if it, if it works. The issue is not a new wire. The issue is just. Oh, so many freebies. Can I use a new wire? Yeah, sure. Give it a try. Yeah. Give it a try. So I take off all everything. Okay, and you start it again. Okay. Starting, starting. Yeah. No, it, it, it did not come up. <laughs> 